It's been a fantastic day uh, for the annual meeting. I really enjoy uh, all the talks and uh, uh, I'm very happy to uh, wrap up with this amazing panel uh, with um, about uh, teaching uh, open science. Uh, and we have the privilege to have uh, four uh, uh, researchers and uh, faculty who have um, uh, done amazing things in this domain. Uh, I'm just gonna introduce them very quickly and I'm just gonna let them uh, tell you what they have done. Uh, basically, the, the, the questions that we asked them was describe a little bit what you have done and say that you are given a large amount of resources. How would you scale up uh, your uh, teaching open science uh, initiatives? So first, uh, we have uh, Fernando Perez. Uh, he is a professor at the statistics department here at uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, and he, um, he created IPython uh, back in 2001 that later uh, grew up uh, into a lar larger initiative that is now uh, Jupiter, the Jupiter eco ecosystem. Uh, he, he probably will tell you more about it, which is an amazing tool that he was just telling me that at least in, in, in Berkeley for the undergrad students, at least there are uh, uh, students in the thousands per semester are using these tools uh, for, for classwork. Um, Garrett Christensen, uh, uh, he is an uh, economist at, at the U.S. Census. Uh, he used to work uh, uh, here at BITS uh, as, as a project scientist, terrific job. Uh, and uh, and uh, he uh, uh, taught several workshops on, on risk transparency and with Ted and, and Cole and Jeremy Feast wrote um, the first uh, text, textbook on open science, Don Moore, he has been also a leader in the open science movement. Uh, he does research in, in, in judgment, in decision making and forecasting. And I think he just finished a course, uh, teaching a course on research transparency. And uh, uh, Simin Desir, another leader in the open science movement. Uh, she is a professor of psychology uh, and uh, does research in personality psychology. And she has taught several uh, research method, method courses uh, of which there's always a component on risk transparency. And basically, take it away. Um, Fernando, do you want to start? Sorry. Yeah, just go for Fernando. Um, so hi, first, thanks uh, a lot for having me here. Um, it's, uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, I, uh, in terms of kind of describing a little bit of the, the work that I've done to your prompt, uh, I'll probably talk uh, briefly about two things. One, a little bit of context uh, for those of you who uh, are not familiar with uh, IPython and uh, what part of Jupyter are. Um, it's a set of uh, open source uh, tools that began as the name implies in Python, which is a programming language. Um, it began as a kind of toy grad student procrastination project a long time ago when I was in grad, grad school. I'm originally a physicist by training. Um, but it has evolved into a, a both uh, a set of tools, but also importantly, a set of open standards that support an ecosystem, uh, an interoperable ecosystem, which is not just our own software implementation, but others that implement it, uh, and, and a human community that actually develops uh, these things, that builds it in a community of multiple stakeholders uh, where we have people for, like myself who are in the academic world, academics in government, a lot, a lot of work at the DOE na uh, national labs, um, places like NCAR, et cetera, but also a lot of participation from industry um, and a huge long tail of a volunteer open source community that brings sort of innovation and resiliency to, to, to the project. Um, and it's a project that is designed to help people basically interact with computers. It's a set of tools for effectively talk, having a computational conversation with a computer. And if that sounds a little bit abstract, um, a concrete uh, image may, may help in, in this regard. One of our key tools and probably the most visible tool in the project is called the Jupyter Notebook. It's basically a web-based environment that looks sort of like a word processor. Think of it like Google Docs, but where in addition to natural language, you can also type programming code. Um, and then you get the output of that code. You get the results, the, 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 the data, the tables, the figures, the plots, etc. So you can build documents that are hybrid of natural language and computation in a single document, and those documents can then become the basis of a publication, a blog post, a scientific article, a set of class materials, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and so these, uh, these kind of layers of software, open standards, and a human community support at the top content, right? People then, a lot of people care about the fact that with these tools you can develop content, and you can develop class materials, you can write your scientific articles, but in a way that is shareable, that is reproducible, 
that you can make accessible to others. We have built services to deploy, uh, to facilitate the deployment uh, of those things um, so that you can give someone a, a link, a post on Twitter, a post on your website, a link, and they can view exactly what that document looks like without having to install any software. Um, in the last few years, we've been building, uh, and when I say we, it's, it's a very large we of thousands of people. A number of key, key folks uh, in that project are here at Berkeley, but not only here. Um, we've built uh, a project called uh, Binder, My Binder, um, that actually began uh, by uh, began uh, its uh, its history at Janelia Farm, which is a neuroscience research lab on the East Coast, and has been kind of adopted by uh, by us. Uh, and others in the Jupyter community, and the idea behind Binder is that it helps you share with others not just a web page, but an actual live computation, so that if you have done work in this fashion, you've built something that requires code and data, um, and uh, but you would like to give it to someone so that they can play with it and actually interact with it and run the computation, and you don't want them to have to have anything other than a web browser that could be actually on their phone or their iPad, um, you can do so, and we basically manage all of the back end of the cloud necessary for that, and we've been developing the standards effectively for how to describe a digital artifact that should be shareable in its entirety. And this is going basically to the notion of reproducible research that David Donahoe, John Buckhide, and Don Clairbout advocated for way back in the 90s that uh, an open reproducible um, scholarly artifact was not a PDF, no matter how well written it is. It should be the entire environment and computational resources necessary to produce a result, and we've tried to basically make that sort of a one-click operation. Um, it has been very successful, it's, it's widely used, and so we sort of build this layered cake of content supported by tools, supported by open standards that allow an ecosystem to exist and ultimately supported by an open community um, as a project that is very much in the spirit of making science open, <coughs> what I would like to call collaborative, open, reproducible and extensible, sort of a set of principles that in my mind and that we've been uh, developing with a, a colleague here uh, at, uh, at Berkeley, uh, a postdoc in my group, uh, are kind of the, the open science counterpart to the fair principles for data access, which is this idea that it's not just about openness, but about collaborative practices. Yes, openness, but also reproducibility as uh, not as a principle of what a publication should look like, but in fact reproducibility as the engine of collaboration, that if you actually make reproducibility something that is at the beginning of your practices, then it becomes, po it is possible to, co to better collaborate and to better construct a scientific enterprise that is itself open. Um, and ultimately, and, and finally, extensibility, which is this idea that your science um, and the, the tools and, the, and the, the, the entities you construct should be designed in a way that others can build upon them in an explicit and deliberate way. So that's sort of the computational machinery, and based on all of that and the ecosystem that surrounds it, I taught here at Berkeley a couple of years ago a course called Collaborative and Reproducible Data Science. Uh, it was listed as part of the stats department, Stat 159. I haven't had a chance to teach it back in the last two years because I've been busy teaching our big data science courses, Data 100, and right now I'm finishing Data 102, which is a brand new course we're developing. But I do have a curriculum on basically collaborative, open, and reproducible uh, research. It was a, a fun experiment. It was very rough around the edges, and I was kind of making stuff up as I went. At the same time, I think it was successful in the sense that students did manage to sort of adopt a set of these practices as a natural thing. The notion that using version control and testing your code and documenting and wrapping everything in a Docker container and collaborating with others and doing so openly um, and building the testing as part of what you do so that at the end I, anyone can grab that repo, rerun it and replicate your figures. That, that that was something that became sort of like brushing their teeth. And the, the analogy that I used was that Git and these practices are sort of the computational hygiene toothbrush of science, right? It's, uh, these are things that you don't do at the very end. That's getting the root canal. You just adopt these practices as, as a daily as a daily habit. And I think we have a proof of existence. I would love to revisit that course and those materials if I had the resources. That's one of the things I would do. Uh, revisit uh, that because there's a lot to polish. But but even the first experiment already left us some positive lessons, and I'd be happy to talk uh, more about that if anyone has questions. And I'll try to keep it at that. Excellent, thanks. Uh, so yeah, I'm Garrett Christensen. I'm an economist at the US Census Bureau, and the disclaimer is that my opinions are my own and don't reflect that of the Census Bureau. So um, I'm an economist by training. I, I got my PhD here at Berkeley, and I worked uh, on randomized trials, including some with TED. And uh, I think I learned more about research design uh, during grad school. And then after grad school, I went and worked with epidemiologists on randomized trials. And you know, we wrote a protocol or 
a pre-analysis plan. We published that in BMJ Open, and I then came to BITS and brought these things I'd learned in, from epidemiology and public health into social science. Uh, the culmination of my work at BITS, I think, was this textbook that uh, Ted mentioned, and it was called Transparent and Reproducible Social Science Research, How to Do Open Science. Uh, we, yeah, thanks. Uh, we broke it down into problems, solutions, which are more statistical, and then practices, more day-to-day -day, uh, things, and the topics just include publication bias, specification searching, registration and meta-analysis, pre-analysis plans, sensitivity analysis, reporting standards, replication, data sharing, including formal privacy, differential privacy, and a reproducible workflow, uh, good for undergrads, like working on their thesis, or grad students uh, in a methods or metrics course. Uh, if you want a more, uh, an, an open, sort of condensed version, we wrote a paper in the Journal of Economic Literature, which maybe from a slightly more econ-centric uh, angle, but still covers a lot of the same topics, and that's open access, the, uh, Transparency, Reproducibility, and the Credibility of Economics Research. Uh, and sort of Ted taught a course based on this that's online. Like, so if you look at the BITS website, uh, you can find links to his, his lectures and also still the Future Learn version available. Um, so that's all on our website. So if I, the, the, one of our prompts was, if I had resources, what would I do uh, to increase the education? Uh, about of open science. So um, one of the things that I enjoyed the most when I was at BITS was small grants. We had this program called SMART, uh, some of which you've seen the results of presented today. Dan's research was a SMART project. Uh, so small grants like that, uh, dissertation fellowships, small research grants, Contests like the Open Science for uh, OSA, Center for Open Sciences Registration Challenge, and also uh, another one I liked was the Election Research Pre Acceptance Challenge. I think small amounts of money go a long way to changing uh, grad students' behavior, and like they get excited about five thousand dollars and are willing to do the paperwork to get five thousand dollars, where maybe an R one tenure track university professor doesn't think the paperwork is worth it for $1,000. Um, but so you could incentivize research that puts these things into practice, writes pre-analysis plans, uses or creates open data, writes a replication paper, and because I met the census, uh, that could be something that maybe someone would be interested in doing is using the Federal Statistical Research Data Center data to do replications. Um, replications of those uh, restricted access data in the restricted environment, um, writing, releasing, and maintaining open source software, creating a completely reproducible one-click workflow, and a, a thing that, again, because I'm at the census, I, I see every day is differential privacy, uh, encouraging education around differential privacy uh, and formal privacy, which Honestly, the stats are a little over my head, and I, I, people at the census have described it as it's currently the state in the state of a chemistry textbook, whereas as a researcher, I am looking for a cookbook. And so differential pr privacy is a new algorithm that can guarantee formally uh, the non-re-identifiability of your anonymized data. Uh, and so I think that that is coming down the line and it's important for researchers to learn to be able to, to incorporate that into their workflow. So that's what I would do if I had more resources. Um, I'm Don Moore. I taught a uh, PhD seminar in reproducibility and open science with uh, Leif Nelson sitting back there. Uh, so shout out to him. Um, he gets the credit for all, all the good ideas that uh, we implemented, including uh, using uh, Ted and Garrett's textbook. Um, the other good thing we did uh, was be lazy and invite um, some really excellent guest speakers, uh, including Ted and Samin, and perhaps uh, most memorably Ellen Avers, um, who did this great thing in class where she sent the students um, several data sets beforehand, um, one of which was fraudulent, one of which was p-hacked, 
and it, one of which was uh, sort of clean best scientific practice and invited the students, so told them a little bit about the study, uh, about the claims that were made based on the evidence and invited them to assess the data sets and try to figure out which one was fraud. Uh, so that was a really fun conversation uh, about um, forensic data analysis and um, uh, detecting uh, um, questionable research practices uh, based on data. Um, the, the class uh, forced us to confront uh, an issue that no doubt all of you are familiar with, and that is um, the conflicting responses to acknowledgments of imperfections in the way that uh, our fields have been practicing science, uh, the mixed responses of um, cynicism and despair on the one hand, the degree to which our published literatures are full, filled with false positives and crap, um, and on the other hand, hope and optimism about a future that implements better scientific practice and that publishes more true, reliable findings. And um, the, especially uh, young people just uh, learning about the field uh, struggle most intensely with these emotional responses. And no doubt you have seen the degree to which the um, open science revolution has been uh, pushed by uh, young people inspired by uh, hope for a better future. Uh, I want to say a few words about um, uh, one of the, the big projects we undertook in class, and it is perhaps that uh, that I would focus on, given infinite resources. So um, it, it, the topics that we talked about in class, many centered on, on reproducibility, and so we ran together a big replication project where at the beginning of the class, we worked together to identify a theme that we all wanted to collaborate on and then identify papers within that literature. We wound up picking one that uh, fortunately had about the right number of published findings, so we s restricted our analysis based on a few uh, really, cr really clear criteria in the hope of having both a, a literature that, that was somehow unified, that is that we were working on um, replications that could fit together in some potentially publishable paper afterwards, that they were connected somehow, uh, and that satisfied, that, that we could pick based on some fairly clear criteria, so we would insulate ourselves to some degree against the accusation that we were just cherry picking uh, results least likely to replicate, given our uh, anticipated concern that, that we might not uh, replicate everything that was published. Uh, we also restricted ourselves to uh, projects where we thought it'd be feasible for us to replicate, uh, given um, that they were collected on MTurk um, and that, that they were experiments that we could run online. So um, having selected that set, then um, each student got assigned a study to replicate and those data were collected over the course of the semester. We, um, uh, they presented those results at the end and we are moving towards publishing those. The wonderful part of that being that um, it, it, as uh, Eric Stroman noted, uh, uh, meta-analyses fall victim to a bunch of problems. Selective reporting, well, we didn't have that, so we clearly identified the set. We are gonna report all the results from all of those replications. Um, Meta-analyses, as Leif uh, and his co-authors have pointed out, also fall victim to endogenous starting and stopping rules. That is, how do you decide when to begin, when a literature starts, and when do you decide when to stop collecting data on a project, or when you've collected enough papers to include in your meta-analysis? Eh, these are both endogenous choices that um, uh, can censor what you're able to collect. In our case, it was very clear what we were going to include, and it didn't suffer from that endo endogenous starting and stopping rule. So we think that the um, effect size estimates that emerged from this project are informative, and that the entire process was um, enlightening for the students in a whole variety of ways, and has a non-zero probability of turning into a publication afterwards if we get our act together and actually write it. Um, uh, so given infinite resources, um, I would love to see better infrastructure. I mean, we aren't the only class project on reproducibility and replication. Students are working on these sorts of things all the time. It'd be great if there were more infrastructure in place to help support that. I know BITS is, is already working on that. So with that, I should hand it over to Samin. Great, so I teach like large undergrad research methods classes, but I also do teach seminars specifically on 
replicability and transparency. Um, but unlike several other people up here, I don't teach any practical skills, partly because I don't have any. Um, so I see what I do more as like the hearts and minds part of transparency and replicability, like why should we care? Um, so some of the topics I teach are things like what responsibilities do we have as scientists? What are the core values of science? Um, what does it mean to say that science is self-correcting? And what makes science trustworthy? Um, how does the replication crisis in psychology and the reactions to it and defensiveness mean for psychology as a science and for self-correction in psychology? Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about my large undergraduate research, intro to research methods class because I think that is more um, generalizable. So like this quarter I taught 450 students and it's a required course for any other psychology class at UC Davis. So no, none of my colleagues want to teach it. It's extremely unpopular to teach. Um, so basically I get like free reign with everybody who comes through who wants, it's not just psych majors, it's like anybody who wants to take any advanced psychology class. So two thirds of the students are not psych majors. Um, and I get them early before they take substantive classes and I might piss off my colleagues with what I teach them, but it's really fun to teach. Um, and so a, a common concern I hear, and Don alluded to this a bit, is that it'll turn students off of social science research to teach them. So I do, I should clarify, so out of the 10 weeks, like eight and a half are just about construct validity and internal validity and external validity. Um, but I do about a week and a half, about one lecture at the beginning and, and two lectures at the end on uh, core values, transparency, um, replicability, things like that. Um, and I've basically condensed that material to a few lectures. I've put those lectures up online. I'm happy, I'll, I'll, I'll tweet the link again after this panel. Um, so, so I'll teach things like the basic logic of null hypothesis significance testing, false positives, false negatives, p-values. And then I teach about the problems so like p-hacking, publication bias, the failed replication. So basically say, making the case that false positives are a really big problem in the literature. And then I teach about um, the reform, so transparency. But I really make the case that transparency has to go hand in hand with rigor. Right? But if we push people to be more transparent, they won't necessarily be more credible. They could be less credible if they're doing bad research. And that works really well in a research methods class because I just spent nine weeks teaching them what rigor means, what is construct validity, what is internal validity. And if, if someone is transparent and gets those things wrong, they're gonna look worse, right? So I talk about how transparency and rigor really go hand in hand. If we're telling people to be more transparent, but they're doing shoddy work, they're gonna be worse off. Um, so I actually condensed most of the core of that to one lecture this time and inspired by a published study where they randomly assigned participants to learn about either just the crisis or the crisis and the reforms and looked at trust in psychology as a science, I actually asked the same questions at the beginning, middle, and end of my lecture to try to kind of get at, are we like driving people away from social science by teaching them about this? But actually I have a first response to that question which is not an empirical response, which is, so what? If it's driving them away, they have a right to know, right? Maybe they shouldn't go into social science. And I think they, that we have an obligation to make them, help them make an informed choice about what they're getting into. So that's my first answer. Um, but the empirical, so this is a, you know just a class activity, but 450 students. I did, unfortunately, the timing of this lecture fell on the evening before Thanksgiving break, but 300 of them were there. And, it, and the first time it rained in like six months, but still, <laughs> so I was pretty happy with the turnout. Um, so the questions I asked at the beginning, middle, and end of the lecture were, on a scale of one to five, how interested are you in getting involved in psychology research? How much do you trust past findings in psychology? And how much do you trust future findings in psychology? And the, the latter two questions were inspired from the study that just came out by Farid Anvari and Daniel Lawkins. So what I found was, as you might expect, that from at the end of the lecture compared to the beginning, trust in past research went down. Uh, trust in research in future research went down and then partially back up, but not all the way back up when they learned about the reforms. Um, but interest in getting involved in psychology stayed the same. It was about three and a half on a five point scale. Um, didn't fluctuate at all between beginning, middle, and end. Now it could be a false negative. Um, but I also wonder if there's a moderator in there and that the people who are still interested in getting involved in psychology research after finding out about this are the people who are energized by these problems. I don't know what characteristics would predict that, but it might be that actually we're filtering out for people who are prepared to deal with these challenges and we're helping the people who don't wanna deal with this to get out early, which I think would be good. Um, so the course evaluations I've gotten in the past suggest, one of the things, uh, you know, I, I don't know, one of the things I like hearing is that they feel like sometimes in their other classes they're being 
told kind of propaganda about science and scientists being like super noble and pure. And I think they appreciate being treated like adults and told that that's not always the case. Um, another anecdote is that it might turn them into pain in the butt research subjects. So they'll go to like studies that they have to do as research subjects and be like, well, is your study adequately powered? And are you just gonna file drawer this if you don't get what you want? But actually, those are completely legitimate questions before you signed an informed consent form. And now my student, Julia Bottasini, is studying this about like, what do research subjects in like basic psychology studies expect will happen with their data and what are they okay with? Like, if we told them, by the way, we might just file drawer it if we don't like the result, or we might pick, cherry pick a result and publish that, um, would they feel okay with their giving their time and data for that? Um, let's see. Um, one last thing is, I think there are a lot of really great resources for teaching these issues. Um, the Ted Miguel's videos are great. There's a lot of other videos, podcasts, media articles, some great science journalists writing about this stuff. Um, there's a new trend towards more accessible research methods papers, not just written for quantitative and statistician types. Um, and there's a collection of syllabi on the open science framework at osf.io slash vkhbt, which you can remember as very kind humans bring tequila. <laughs> um, so there you can find a bunch of people's syllabi for r open science, replicability, transparency courses. Terrific. Um, so um, I now open up to the floor if people have questions, comments, uh, I see Eric Van Dusen on the back. Uh, Aaron also has played a very important role in, in promoting the usage of uh, tools like Jupyter uh, around campus. Um, so if anybody wants to jump in and say something. So I'll, I'll open the question and ask, um, I think Simeon already said something about that, that exposing some of these methods to students might actually change who actually wants to participate in those methods in both ways. I agree with you that part of that is good because to some extent they're going to disperse throughout the university and they're going to be to some extent honest eyes in other labs, um, which is always a good thing. Um, I come from Cornell. Um, I guess one question, and I'm biased in this perspective because I currently have two teenagers exactly at that cusp. Shouldn't we actually be pushing that even further back? This is sort of the first class that they get, period and then they can decide whether or not this is actually the kind of thing they want to do and maybe even pushing it beyond because having taught this to undergrads for the stuff that I'm doing, I think a lot of high school students could actually do some of this as well, helping them in their choice of selecting where they might want to go because technically pu pulling up a Jupyter notebook is point and click easy mm -hmm. and they're, they're getting trained on Python and R or other things in these classes right now. And that might not be everybody, but it might be exactly those that we're actually trying to entice to come into university. Why not even start easier, uh, earlier? Is that something that in your experience might be desirable and or feasible? I think it's absolutely both desirable and feasible. I mean, at least the kind of stuff that I teach, which is really simple, basic things about like, what does it mean well, how is science different from pseudoscience and what is the role of self-correction and what does self-correction look like? I mean, those are things that are kind of implicitly getting taught, I think, in grade school. I don't know, I don't have kids, but I think, I, I make jokes about like, you learned this in your third grade science class. And I think Leif's daughter famously did learn about this kind of thing in her science class. Um, so yeah, I think it would be great. I mean, I think it would be relatively easy to design materials that high school teachers could use. And I think that would be really nice. I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, it, it would make a lot of sense to do um, uh, less geometry and more statistics uh, in uh, high school courses, and um, uh, that would lead directly to an exploration of, of exactly these sorts of issues, statistical proof and false positives, and the degree to which you, it's easy to fool yourself and fool your colleagues about what qualifies as truth. So, um I certainly agree, and, but I, I want to kind of bring up a couple of concrete data points on that. Uh, first, Data8, this very large and very successful course we have here on campus on Foundations of Data Science is offered as a straight up freshman course with zero prereqs, and it's very successful, and I think, I mean, at that point you could move it one or two years earlier and it'd be probably about the same thing. Um, I did teach some of this stuff a while back in high schools, uh, and with appropriate time and the right motivating examples, uh, it went very well, and the experience was very, very good. Um, and there's a really interesting example going on right now in Canada. So the province of Alberta began a project called Callisto, uh, together with a nonprofit called Cybera, to deploy 
to basically provide both the technical infrastructure of Jupyter Hubs available to, to uh, school teachers and the curriculum development support to bring basically to use Jupyter as a platform to develop kind of age and culturally appropriate context materials to teach. In this case, it was more uh, around teaching uh, mathematical, uh, uh, math-related topics. It wasn't kind of core research methods, but, but te teaching technical ideas illustrated with very kind of local cultural context kind of examples and whatnot. Uh, for example, geometry with uh, uh, basket weaving patterns, kind of the, the, the traditional patterns of, of, the, of the tribes in the region to using that to build computations to illustrate geometric ideas. And that was deployed uh, originally in, in Alberta and it's been so successful that now they're deploying it Canada-wide. So it's a Canada-wide initiative to use this machinery to bring those ideas down to the kind of school elementary, middle, and high school level. Um, I don't know the full details, but the project calls, is called Callisto um, in Canada, and the nonprofit that runs it is called Cybera in Alberta. So happy to put you in touch if anyone's interested. So thanks very much for a really interesting panel. It, it seems to me that the best way to get students to embrace uh, a lot of the tools and the need mm -hmm. for open, uh, open science uh, tools and so forth is um, is to provide examples of the costs of not embracing those tools. And so when I was new to this, one of the most influential papers was Ted's Sierra Leone paper where they carefully went through a series of results uh, that might have led to one set of conclusions uh, and then using the same data presented a parallel table with a very different set of results suggesting a different set of conclusions. That to me reinforced the idea that we need to specify in advance which set of results are gonna guide us for the, for the takeaway from the paper. And so I wonder whether from a pedagogical standpoint, somebody could invest in creating a library of examples like this. Some could be from real studies, some could be cooked up, um, that we all could then draw on in our teaching uh, to illustrate to students the costs of not pre-registering, not being open, and not adopting all of the tools that you're all innovating. That to me would be a really important investment that could help all of us. Sounds good. <laughs> Let's do it. Hi. Um, uh, so in all the discussion about training students, the assumption is that we're training uh, future scientists and researchers, which sounds good, but all, very, very few people become researchers or scientists, but almost everybody consumes research and science, whether it's reading the New York Times or whether it's scrutinizing some presentation in a business seminar or whatever it is, is there an argument that we should be teaching classes not about how to be a good open scientist, but how to read other people's science and know which stuff is true and which stuff is not? That's basically the mindset I have going into my undergrad intro to research methods class. Like I assume most of them are not gonna become researchers and so I, I ask myself what what would make them be good consumers of science. And I've had people go into like law and public policy and things like that and write me back later and said that that was relevant to what they're doing now. So I think that's exactly the right mindset. I think the main difference is just how deep you go into it. So for example, I used to try to explain P-curve and why P-value is close to 0.05 or less trustworthy and so on. And now I still go into it a little bit, like I'll show them the graph of like a, a, a literature that is P-hacked versus a literature that's not and show the distribution of p-values, but I end up kind of saying, take my word for it, like if you see a string of p-values close to 0.05, that should raise red flags for you, um, more so than I would if I was training people who I thought were gonna be producing p-values themselves. But yeah, I think, I think we should have, I mean, I think there should be like a critical thinking about science class that should be required for all college students, maybe high school students, that would be aimed that way as like, how to be a good consumer of science. And also, it should be taught to all journalists, especially science journalists. So I would just add a quick point about high school students. Um, thanks to BITS, we, our nonprofit was funded to do uh, some work for five weeks after students took the AP Psychology exam. And so and that's usually kind of the classic time period to do movie, hang out, and uh, not do any work. And so there was five weeks before the school year ended. And so we spent some time actually teaching students uh, some of these processes. And I think one of the things that was really interesting about the work and having them develop their own kind of team-based correlational research studies was at the end when they had to present out this work to school administrators to recommend ideas to improve the school climate, 
I think that's when things clicked as in why research and science has to be done. For those of us that do applied research, we understand very clearly the implications of research not being done well. Um, and so I think the, the biggest takeaway, I think, for students in that process as being consumers is saying, wow, I want to make sure that as a, an eventual taxpayer that our, our dollars are being used well, that our, my peers, that other students in my school are ultimately getting benefits to improving the school climate based on things that actually work as opposed to someone coming in and delivering an assembly that isn't going to create school-wide change. Um, so, yeah, I, if there are folks that are interested in that work, that's something that we're continuing uh, to do, and I can uh, share some of that because I would love some insights and help as, as our a nonprofit hopes to scale more of that with uh, AP Psychology courses. I actually want to reemphasize a point that life made um, that not all students are going to be scientists, uh, but they're all going to do something with the skills that they have. And so, at least in, in economics, many of the students that have gone out, the idea that whatever you do is reproducible, if not only because your manager said, Oh, sorry, I asked you for the wrong thing, can you do this with this other input data set? And you click the button and it's done. Um, I found that to be a pretty cogent. Um, example as well. So to walk them through an example, what if you didn't do it, okay, here's an, to pick this one industry, create this one statistic, now do it for the next 300. Um, your Excel spreadsheet might not work the same way, is, is something that actually speaks to a lot of both actual professionals and, and high school students the same way. Yeah, there are a couple other really great resources for illustrating that. So one is 538.com did an article on p-hacking several years ago, and in it there's an interactive thing where you can analyze real data and change your operational definition of variables until you get a significant p-value. And another one is a project called Many Analysts where uh, all research teams were given the same data set and asked to answer the same research question, but they could define it in different ways and analyze it in different ways, and it shows the range of results you can get that way, and there's a more recent one where, I can't remember what they called it, but where they define the research question and then let everyone collect data however they want to try to answer that question and they show the spread of results you get when, when you have flexibility at that stage. So those are all, I think, great examples of, uh, that would be, I think, accessible to students. Yeah. I've yeah. got a question. Yes. Uh, we were prompted to say what we would do if we had resources. I thought uh, that uh, a different but similar question was what would we do if we had influence? And I have no influence on uh, core graduate economics uh, education. Um, but I, if I did, I would make the first year core much less theoretical and abstract and focus on applied econometrics where this reproducibility stuff is is more relevant my, in my mind than to much more abstract uh, micro theory that I personally in my career don't really use. Uh, so I'm curious for non-economists uh, what you would change might change about sort of the and I know all disciplines don't have this like this uniform core like econ does, but what you would change about sort of the intro steps in your graduate programs. I think it's really challenging at the graduate level. So I teach my replicability seminar at both the undergrad and grad level, and I find it much, much harder at the grad level because they're actively being taught opposite things by their mentors in their labs. <laughs> and so, yeah, I have to do this like dance about like how I tell them what's what are best practices but then like <laughs> they're telling me what they're doing in their labs with undergrads it's a lot easier they're much more um, yes yeah, so I don't know like I are we imagining no, that there would be no pushback from our colleagues or <laughs> <laughs> that you can move past the pushback something like that. one one thing I would, I would say please go ahead. Uh, I was just gonna um, reiterate the condition if you had influence <laughs> <laughs> So I'm, I'm, I'm officially faculty in statistics, but I'm not a statistician. And I was actually trained very much like a very traditional particle physicist. We have, we have equations that model the world. We solve PDEs. We develop numerical methods. We have forward models. Uh, and 
and one thing that I've found, is, and that's continues, I mean, I continue seeing PhD graduates in the natural sciences who come actually with the same kind of mental makeup that, that I think I had. And uh, I have found myself having to learn a huge amount around what I would call statistical intuition, right? And which is very different. I mean, I, I have enough math under my belt to handle the technical aspects, but building the right intuition around statistical and inferential thinking with complex noisy data takes time. It's not a skill. It's not a technical skill. It's a skill. It's something that requires that your brain gets molded for a while, messing with the data, seeing the subtleties, using the methods and seeing them fail. Uh, and I really wish we had a lot more. And now that I'm in a little bit of a position to do, do that, I'm, we're starting to think about how to push through the data science initiative on campus, how to push more of that, in my case, towards the, the physical sciences and natural sciences, but same can be said elsewhere. Um, because I think we need a lot more of that. This goes back to your, even high school students ought to be doing more stats and less calculus. I, I completely agree, and be, because it's not about the, the mathematical manipulations, it's about building a certain flavor of, of, it's a combination of critical thinking, but with a technical anchor that honestly takes time to develop, and I think the best way to develop it is by doing practical hands-on, very constructive, and in this case, the computation is, is, I mean, we have the luck now of having the tools to do it, because it's kind of the, I, ha I have a little girl right now, three-year-old, and it's, it's the Play-Doh thing, right? It's grab the data and the computer are your Play-Doh. Just play with it, get dirty, get messy, a lot. And over time, you will build that, and then you will bring that sense of, intu of intuition and critical thinking to your research, et cetera. But I think we need a huge, a, a lot more of that throughout um, the disciplines, and we need it at the undergraduate level, but we also need it at the PhD level, because even highly technical fields are doing a disservice, by, by which I mean theoretical physics, right, are doing a disservice to their students uh, with that. I, my impression is in engineering, we are doing the same disservice. I'm not completely sure, but that's my impression from what I see, is that the same is missing in the engineering. I find myself on a committee reviewing the curriculum for our MBA program. Pity me. Uh, the one thing that they, that our alumni and our students are begging uh, most passionately for is uh, more content on, on data science, um, such that even if they aren't leading the charge on uh, th their um, data analyses, that they have um, the insights and the sophistication to be able to make sense of and ask the right critical questions of those who are bringing them analyses and interpretations of their data. I think one thing if I had unlimited influence that I would like graduate students to be trained in is to question uh, like the eminence and status-based prestige that we give to like top journals and to top researchers and top universities and things like that and to really deeply consider the possibility that they might be wrong. Not just in individual cases, but even that their values might be wrong and things like that. Um, but that's also arming them for a world that's not going to reward that. I recently got a direct message from on Twitter from a postdoc who had uh, written a critique of a paper by a really famous person in their field. Their critique had actually been accepted and published in a very prestigious journal, but their PI like berated them in front of the group and said, you crossed a line, don't ever do that again. <laughs> so like, but th like they went into science, right, probably thinking this is what you're supposed to do. I found an error, I corrected it, I d went through the channels, I got it into a top journal and they still got punished for doing that. So I would like them all to be like that, but then I would be sending them off into a world where that's not gonna be rewarded. Um, I, have, I have a kind of related question. So I, I think most people in this room w would agree that a lot of these open science practices should be part of the core. That's kind of the ideal. Um, but and what a lot of what we do at Bits is we we have these trainings. You know, they're one to three days. Uh, we help develop curricular resources. Um, but it's hard to, as many of you have mentioned, it's it's hard to get this into the core without having a ton of influence. So I'm I'm wondering your impressions about how to create a, a sea change? Like, are, are we really just waiting on all of these younger students who seem to be um, motivated and, and convinced by these, uh, by how you're teaching them to kind of, you know, grow up and become the professors? Or, or should we be focusing on trying to convince more established researchers to be teaching this? And, and if that is the case, then how do we do that? I think one thing we have to do too is. Uh, those of us who are in a position to do so is uh, apply for and accept gatekeeping roles where we can change the incentive structure because teaching isn't the only thing. We have to actually make that those practices 
be able to survive if you're engaging in those practices in academia. And so I think being willing to take on editorships or grant panel, I mean, there's a, a question about like how much should you work within the system versus like if it's really messed up, walk away. And I struggle with that a lot. But if there's if the system seems open to change, then I think being willing to take on those roles and playing that role to help shape the incentive structure, to help create a world where the students who are taught those things aren't then later punished for acting them out. I think that's one thing that people at mid to late career stages can do. When I, I want to kind of bounce a little bit of this back to Eric Van Dusen in the back of the room, because Eric works here. The data science education program has a model that includes what they call the data science modules, and he would know a lot more about it. But the idea, for those of you who are not familiar, is this notion of having teeny bits of content, potentially one lecture or two lectures, and you can talk to Eric more for the details, that can get dropped into existing curricula. And that's the magic trick, because then it doesn't require changing the, the curriculum, right? Because it's an existing courses, and so you don't have to fight kind of against, we already have too much stuff. Um, and second, it lowers the barrier for the faculty who teach those courses, who may be open to the idea, but they don't have the bandwidth, they don't quite have the skills, they don't have the time to develop this. It's too much of a lift, they're just open to the idea. So they have teams that basically partner with the faculty come and help develop that bit of content and then that little modular blob is now available to be used and they can explain more but my understanding is it's been a, a very successful model to getting some of the the data science idea put into context specific courses uh, of a very very broad spectrum and I think the same could be done with some of these ideas it's my impression so I hope I'm not putting you too much on the spot Eric or that I didn't butcher too much the ideas but Uh, yeah, I just wanted to comment on, on some of the discussion. I love the modules. If you want to do a module, definitely everything that he said is correct. I want to go back to the other topic that, like, I think the place that we should go is to, like, the base econometrics class, like Econ 140 or the grad 240A. Like, we should get those people, like, right when they're starting their upper division or grad statistics. And... Uh, probably the MBA statistics as well, and like integrate it right into that core sequence. I just want to say something that I see this weird other trend, and this is back to Fernando and thinking of like where do you teach reproducibility in data 100 or data 102, is that machine learning is coming. And uh, like when we learned statistics, there was like a model that was related to economic theory and there was a way to test things that was related to an economic model. With machine learning, it's a little bit strange where you can throw any variables you want and the model might tell you what are the best variables. And uh, there's a little bit of black box going on and I'm just commenting that I see this in the students today that are maybe more susceptible to learning about reproducibility. At the same time, they're learning this uh, unstructured modeling that allows the data to tell me what's happening and that makes me a little fearful right at the same time. You want to comment on that? <laughs> well, that's why a bunch of us right now are working on a NSF proposal around AI and physics precisely to try to try to crack a one of the one of the ideas to crack a little bit of that open because that's that is certainly one of my big concerns, uh, right? And we these these hammers are powerful, but the whole world is not a nail. Um, and, uh, and I still think there's a very, very large uh, and interesting and intellectually fertile ground to be, to be kind of plowed at connecting, connecting uh, ML and statistical methods with, with areas where we have a notion of what a predictive model is. Um, and that's just my bias, but for me, that's easier. It's easier to think about that in the context of physical law. Right where um, uh, where uh, where we actually do have a well validated sense of, of of the structure of our models, but there still may be enough stochasticity and enough noise and enough approximations even in our good models to allow for these tools to actually shine and to be effective and be powerful. But for us to understand and control a little bit better uh, how how one maps into the other, it's the space that I find is is where maybe we have the most intellectual control to approach that question because in the context of like ad prediction or something, forget it. I mean that that's just. Uh, that, that question is not really answerable in that space. Machine learning and, and um, uh, big data tools uh, do provide uh, additional power in, in some circumstances, uh, but with great power comes great responsibility. Uh, and uh, there are obviously um, uh, useful methods like holdout samples and cross-validation that can um, 
uh, be useful for um, uh, coming to, to more valid conclusions uh, with um, uh, m machine learning models that aren't really theory driven where um, you're just looking for patterns but uh, the opportunities to, uh, for um, people to fool themselves or businesses to fool themselves uh, capitalizing on chance in data mining uh, are even larger as, as the data, gets, data sets get bigger obviously and um, so uh, it, it is I will concur with the sentiment you expressed and the need to, to um, warn our, our students of, of these potentials. But, but it does sound that, that there's a, an opportunity in t I have this. Uh, I think that there's an opportunity to, to thinking about back to the, the, this 538 article that it shows a little bit the, the, the potential for p-hacking with a very highly uh, simplified example like, and, and combining it with a more like powerful um, uh, computing environment like an, in a Jupyter Hub or something like that uh, where you could uh, kind of demonstrate, uh, I don't know, the potential biases, the the, 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 the degree of flexibility that you can have with uh, different machine learning algorithms at a very uh, uh, introductory level. So something like intro to stats or something like that. Here is uh, your random forest that it's an ensemble of different things, but at the same time, uh, you, you might not understand what's going on, but you at least you can see that there are these five uh, different combinations that will give you totally different results. And um, I think that, that, that could be uh, pedagogical. Uh, thank you very much. I also want to have some kind of uh, question. Partly it has been answered uh, by the two previous speakers in terms of uh, kind of integrating open science teaching. Uh, I work with the university and uh, I, most of the time I work with uh, graduate students at master's level public health. And uh, I was just trying to wonder how do you, I just want to pick your experience in terms of how do you introduce this in a setting where, uh, in a university setting where if you introduce any course or anything, you have to go through a, a lot of processes and uh, uh, developing the curriculum, having it approved by the high institution of learning and the like. I like what you say that you can introduce something small but again, I, I see what we are discussing involves both, uh, I think there's an ethical bit of it, and also there is the rigorous statistical uh, kind of skills and concepts and being able to apply them. Yeah, there's the other part of the, um, so I was wondering, uh, in your teaching, most of you have heard you've really told this, uh, have you taken the line of statistics? You've introduced it from the biostatistics classes, or did you have like separate seminars, or was it in the ethics classes, something like that? I just wanted to pick your approach, the practical way you introduce this in your teaching, in case I wanted to do such back in my university. What Leif and I did was, uh, um, cross-disciplinary PhD seminar. Uh, he's in marketing, I'm in organizational behavior, and it happened that we had the bandwidth to teach this dedicated class. Obviously, that's that's sort of the um, high effort way to do it, uh, class dedicated to open science and reproducibility. Um, much more accessible, I think, is the modular version that Fernando was talking about. But I, I think it's worth very briefly telling the story of how Data8 com came to be, because it's a really brilliant bit of kind of guerrilla hacking within a university that that team did. That course is today one of the largest courses on this campus, okay? It has, it sees about th close to 3,000 students per year, so it's absolutely gigantic, right? And how, how'd you get that into the system? What they did was they started offering it as one of these cross-listed bizarro electives that sits in the middle of nowhere, right, and that no one cares too much about. And so those things get approved and rubber stamped pretty quickly because some faculty say they want to teach it. And then they began scaling it up. And next thing you know, they have this thing that was being taken by hundreds, or at that point, I don't know, close to a thousand students, I think. So then they went and said, oh, well, actually, this is a great course, and look who are, all the people who are taking it. We want to make it uh, satisfy the requirement for interest statistics and this and that and that and that. And then all of a sudden, now it became data eight. And so it changed its number from the 88 series, which is the 
kind of the no, the no man's land of the courses nobody cares about into a real course. Um, and then it became the foundation of the data science major. And so yes, there was bureaucracy to be dealt with a lot. And I'm, I'm not d diminishing the effort they, they put, but the point is by the time they went to fight the bureaucracy, they had already beaten the bureaucracy because they had, oh, they had the demand was on the ground, right, every semester. And so the bureaucracy couldn't really argue against it. And I think that was brilliant. A lot of that credit, I think, goes to Catherine Carson, who many of, many of you in this room know, um, and, uh, and the team around her. So I think it's worth kind of telling that little story for those of you who are planning battles with your administrations. In, in the big undergraduate research methods class, there's uh, three places where I inject this material. So one is the very first week is about kind of baby philosophy of science. So like, what is science? And there I talk about like what makes science different from pseudoscience or from other ways of knowing. And there you can bring in some of these values, that the idea that we're accountable, that we're transparent, and so on. The second is the ethics module in research methods. So usually we just talk about informed consent. But I also talk about what obligations do scientists have to society and so on, um, and to our participants to report results accurately. And then the third is under statistical validity, which is usually one of the topics in a research methods course. Um, instead of teaching them the formula for an ANOVA and a chi-squared test and so on, I decide to teach them what a p-value means and what it takes for a p-value to have statistical integrity. So there you bring in pre-registration and transparency and p-hacking and all of that. So those are things that you don't have to be radical to like put them into a research methods class. You can just use the topics that are already there and, and bring in these kind of slight twists on those topics and maybe no one will notice. 